it depending on where you happen to uh, to be at the moment. Uh, I am Lorenzo Senici. I'm your host for a new episode of the Snake Man Slayer. And before we get to we get to today's interview, I uh, would like to remind you once again that if you're enjoying this. Uh, this broadcast and my uh, my content to subscribe to ha- to my app feed and download the app so that you can re- stay updated on uh, all <clears throat> following uh, on all uh, following episodes and such, uh, and also support my work with the coins that Haps is kind enough to provide you with. Okay, uh, now this is done. Uh, I, I, I should I should really register it at some point so i don't have to repeat it all the time but anyway now let's introduce uh today's guest uh so we have uh nicholas mccarney from the uh, from illinois in the u.s a restoration ecologist uh who is currently working on building uh on establishing corridors for native wildlife and uh you need recon- uh, reconstructing at least when possible um de- uh, degraded degraded habitats so thank you nicholas for being here today yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I'd like to first apologize for my informal attire, but we had to do this at work today due to connectivity issues at my place, so I was unable to change out of my work gear. Oh, don't worry. Like if you if if you can't accept a biologist like that, then this is not the place for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you uh, as as I said, you are uh, at least you, you you are a restoration ecologist. Uh, so this this is already this already bear uh, this already comes with several interesting aspects to uh, to discuss. So what what is ecological restoration first of all? Right. So ecological restoration is essentially taking areas that have been impacted by anthropocentric means, either for developmental issues, agricultural issues, or anything related to human activities in the area. So these are areas that are typically degraded beyond the point of any sort of natural return. They're either overrun by invasive or non-native species, or they have, they're completely devoid of life due to herbicide and pesticide application and, and just general um, impacts from, from human activities. So restoration ecology is essentially the the creation of new ecosystems that are akin to what would have been there historically so it's not necessarily a management of an ecosystem or the preservation of an existing ecosystem although that does fall under the capacity of what we do as restoration ecologists if we do are lucky enough to have areas that maintain some sort of natural you know hydrology or floristic or biodiversity in some manner but Essentially, what we're trying to do is take all of these fragmented habitats and sort of remove those barriers and create these biological oases and interconnect those those biological oases for for different flora and fauna to sort of establish and provide their essential ecosystem services that they they no, no longer can do because of you know those human activities. So. Oh yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's uh, another thing that you that you just mentioned. Indeed, you were uh, you were talking about fragmented uh, fragmented habitat, and yeah, another. Th- this is something. At least I'm 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 not an ecologist myself, but for for what I know, this this has been like an a raging debate for decades within the ecological community. Like, how bad is habitat fragmentation, and how do you even define whether a, a habitat is fragmented or not? So. Uh, how do you how do you go about defining this this sort of thing and how do we how can we remedy it? So I, I guess I would consider habitat fragmentation as something that, like you said, is kind of debated as far as like what its impacts are overall. But I think that's also because different biologists or ecologists look at it from different levels. So if you're looking at it from a floristic level, an area is not necessarily going to be as fragmented because those plants aren't necessarily moving on their own. I mean, there's obviously some expansion and contraction due to either, you know, ideal habitat or just their general reproductive potential that those plants have. But if you're looking at it from like a floristic standpoint, like an area might be really biodiverse. However, if you're looking at that same area from a faunal standpoint and you're looking at like, for example, herbs, because obviously why wouldn't you use that as an example? Um, those areas are 
exceptionally more fragmented because the herps are moving across roads or they're moving through areas that uh, don't have cover or food sources or water sources or whatever. And to, uh, you know, from that aspect of it, it's, it's very fragmented. So in my opinion, a fragmented habitat is any habitat that has any sort of anthropogenic influence that restructures how it would interact with a neighboring habitat. So if it's not continuous due to some formation, that habitat is fragmented. I think that's something that most people would agree on as well. Um, but then you have to look at it from different perspectives. Uh, you have to look at it from both flora and fauna and the multiple aspects of fauna too. You can't, I, as much as I would love to, I can't just focus on herps all the time. I have to look at what other animals, yeah, exactly. I would love to focus on snakes every day, but I have to look at the insects and the birds and everything and how those are impacted as well because uh, if the more you spend in nature, and I think this is true for anybody, you, the more you realize how interconnected everything is and even just lacking one small portion of that overall ecosystem biodiversity in one taxa or another can completely render an ecosystem ineffective at doing its ecosystem services. And yeah, it, I happen to be from Northern Illinois, which is arguably one of the most fragmented habitats in the entire world due to excessive, excessive agriculture. Um, we have no native corridors between agriculture. It's just miles and miles of un uninterrupted cornfields. And what little habitat we have left is so degraded and impacted by the edge effects and the um, essentially just the hyper presence of these disturbances all around it that they're slowly even under restoration losing biodiversity so we're a great example of what not to do as far as uh preserving ecosystems goes yeah and there's, since i can since i can imagine that it would be beyond foolish to think that the the pre the pre uh, human impact condition can be fully restored because let's face it those crop fields aren't going anywhere but mm -hmm. Like in, even even in, in such a situation, like what? Uh, how can a simple uh, a simple cor one a simple corridor, like a simple like uh, strip of land that connects two of these from two of these fragmented habitats? What kind of an impact can it have on uh, even such a small thing have on the on the survival and uh, equilibrium of of an ecosystem? Right. That's that's a great question. So I will use uh, a very famous flagship species. Uh, the monarch butterfly is a, a great example of this. So monarch butterfly populations are in a massive, massive astronomical decline in recent years. And a lot of hypotheses and studies are coming out and showing that it's because of a lack of it takes, I think, three to five generations of the monarch to make the full migration route. Um, so obviously they need to reproduce several times during that, which means stopping over at the, the milkweed plants without that milkweed present anymore in the buffers of these agricultural zones, their species is declining. However, what it seems to be happening, and this is, um, I, I've read a few studies on this, so there's nothing that's necessarily super concrete, but the statistics are basically saying there's a correlation with the presence of these agricultural fields and the milkweed that grows there because common milkweed is a relatively, uh, I'll use quotations, weedy plant. Um, but it's super beneficial to the monarchs because the more sensitive species that they use to reproduce aren't necessarily there anymore. So it's vital to their reproduction, but uninterrupted agriculture is seeing a massive decline in these populations. And that's just because we're applying more herbicide so these roadside buffers and natural areas, or at least the natural milkweed that would normally be occurring there is no longer occurring there in the density, which can be leading to a decline in their population. Now, that's not to say that that's the main decline, because most, most researchers and biologists will say climate change is, to, is the source of the overall decline in populations. But there's going to be other contributing factors because of that. And one of them is a lack of habitat due to these inter uninterrupted agricultural systems that just keep expanding as well. So the to, to, to go about a long way of answering your question, 
it's vitally important to have these, just these micro ecosystems, even as just a stopping point for these these species. Because I think a lot of people say, well, if it's only fl flowers in this area, what's the purpose? Well, you've got those migratory birds, you've got the insects and everything. And of course, our pollinators are not doing great. So any little thing is better than nothing, in some opinion. So that's that's usually my my take on it is even if it's a micro habitat and it's not necessarily providing all of the ecosystem services that a larger habitat would be it's still providing some level of ecosystem services and is crucial on a large scale to have as many of those as possible to sort of interconnect those migratory habitats oh yeah so basically from from what you're saying it's uh, it sounds to me like some something that i've um i've already uh, heard and read quite a few times that yeah perhaps some sometimes some the 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 more like doom mongering narrative relating to uh to conservation is like oh yeah we 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 we, we will never be able to bring back what what, what once was but based based on what you're saying perhaps it's we, we don't even need to get to that point at least mm -hmm. because some some species at least well many um wildlife species both Animal uh, animals and plants are quite resilient. So even with like limited, uh, like a downscale proportion of what their habitat once was, they can manage to persist. So maybe we, we, we could see this in a more positive light. Like even even if we can't go all the way back, still we can we can avoid going all the way forward in the wrongest manner possible. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great way of putting it. And I can think of many examples. I'll just use the, the generally I do prairie restoration because Illinois is known as the prairie state. We used to be historically over 60% prairie. We have destroyed over 99.99% of our historic prairie. So we have 0.01% of remnant prairie remaining. And it takes tens of thousands of years to establish those prairies. Uh, you've got your glaciation, which obviously is not going to happen anymore to replenish the, the soil structure. And then you've got uh, historic uh, burn occurrences and things like that that don't happen on a frequent enough level to replenish that. And it takes tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years to create an ideal prairie. That being said, I will take an agricultural field and I will turn that in four years to a native dominant at least floristically, ecosystem that still grows most, if not all, of the native species of prairie plants that would normally grow in that area. So it's it's not that it's necessarily all or nothing. True, it won't be the same as it was historically, and we probably will never know how actually beneficial these ecosystems were or what ecosystem services they provided, at least on what scale they were doing that. But it's not necessarily like, oh, let's just give up and turn this agricultural field into uh, some housing development, which is generally what happens. Um, we want to acquire that land that's not good for agriculture and then utilize it for, you know, the restoration of these ecosystems. And in Illinois, although we have 0.01% remaining of our natural prairies, it's still a massive, massive push to restore these pollinator areas and the biodiversity that you can find in those areas, even just, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years after their establishment is astronomically higher than the fragmented and, you know, uh, unrestored habitat that exists. Oh yeah, and that 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 also uh, prompts me to uh, to ask the the, the next question. That for, first of all, I was I was still uh, I'm so sorry if I looked a bit distracted. I was just thinking, did did I really say wrongest a few minutes ago? Like, holy <laughs> crap! Like, not speaking English on a daily basis for months has re really really shows. Oh, I yeah, I can't even imagine. So, uh, I mean, just k kudos to you in general. I, I speak English on a daily basis. And it's my first language, and I mess it up all the time. I'm terrible at English. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a lot yeah. coming from you. But yeah, yeah. So I was uh, was thinking because, like, perhaps on the on the opposite end of the on the opposite extreme of the spectrum, like you. Sometimes you, you you have advocates of what uh, what like it's called uh, like Pleistocene rewilding, for instance, in the in the United States. Uh, they they basically claim that yeah, since uh, at least until not too long ago, like we're we're talking like only tens of thousands of years uh, in the past. Like in even in the United States, there were 
elephant-like animals like uh, mastodons and mammoths and such, lions, um, giant glyptodons. So they some 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 eco even like uh, widely renowned ecologists are saying why why don't we bring them back in the sense let's bring elephants from Asia or Africa and lions and such so that we can refill those vacant ecological niches and like what what, what would be like at least based on um, on your uh, on your work at least in the within within Illinois what, what would be your your take on that so do you think this could ever be feasible or perhaps it's wishful thinking if not even harmful in a way that is a great question and i have like a multi-tiered answer the first being that we do some level of rewilding here we have bison that we let roam free in illinois it was, uh, free is definitely in quotations but in large fenced in natural areas that are multi you know hectares of of land and to the the what we see is twofold one we see that the compaction that they're doing to the soil is actually beneficial in to some degree because they compact it in a way that the plants are are benefiting from that compaction rather than like if we drove a, a tractor around it and then you hyper compact that soil so it's it's different but it the soil is compressed and is therefore more beneficial for certain species of plants but also the grazing of those bison in the tall grass areas, which are typically most of the, the types of prairie that we have in Illinois, the, it lowers the overall height of the tall grass, which allows for more sensitive, rarer plant species to grow. So for, in those areas, it's super feasible and we can do it in certain areas to some degree. Um, and then I'll get to the like bringing in elephants in a second. But I wanted to anecdotally talk about this. When I worked at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, they've been restoring their area for probably since the 70s. And they have bison there, but they're very, very uh, condensed into a fenced in area because they're right in the middle of a developed area. So if they were to let them go, there could obviously be interactions with humans that would be negative and could not benefit the bison. However, in lieu of the presence of bison in their nat native prairie areas, they have used hemiparasitic plants as pseudo grazers. So essentially what they're doing is using a plant that gets half of its nutrients by attaching to the roots of the surrounding plants, thus dwarfing them and replicating the lower grass levels that would take place due to the grazing of historic megafauna. And what they're seeing is in those areas where these hemiparasitic plants like toad flax and um, I'm gonna forget the other one, of course, but um, uh, where those areas are, there's higher quality plants, higher floristic diversity in those areas because of the reduction in the overall height of the prairie. So it's feasible in certain areas. And in the areas where it's not feasible, we're coming up with ways, Pedicularis canadensis. I can't remember the, that's the other plant that I can't remember the common name of. But um those two hemiparasitic plants are super beneficial and could therefore be utilized in areas where rewilding is definitely not possible, such as urban areas. To answer the other part of the question, could we bring back like synthetic Pleistocene megafauna? I think that it could be beneficial. In Florida, they've released horses and bison in their natural areas, and it's super good. Obviously, we know that we don't have the historic, the historic horses that were here are extinct, and all of the horses that are existing, the wild horses in the United States are uh, introduced uh, species, but they function essentially in the same niche, or at least to a, a, a similar enough degree that it's beneficial to those environments. I personally would love if we introduce megafaunal predators to help one control the excessive amount of herbivores such as white-tailed deer that we have. And I think that would help recover the ecosystem. I don't necessarily know about the feasibility of like elephants or like African large predators or things like that Th you know the non-scientist in me says that would be absolutely amazing and i would love <laughs> to see elephants in the united states um and under controlled conditions even but i think that what we're running into like when we see the rewilding of areas using wolves for like the, a, a primary example is that people are just not on board with that and 
it's going to take a really big societal shift and understanding the importance of ecology before something like that can be implemented in the United States. Because uh, there's, there's other places around the world that are doing similar things like Pleistocene Park it very effectively where they're rewilding using these synthetic Pleistocene megafauna to, for lack of a better term. And it's, it's, it's going very well. I'm just curious if, if it will ever take hold in the United States, given that we have a very anti-nature, we want to control and condense nature as much as possible for our own benefit. It's changing to some degree, but I don't think it's in the degree that would allow that to happen, at least not in the foreseeable future. But on a personal level, I would absolutely love that. And I think that the benefits of doing that could be vast. And oh, yeah, that's that's definitely one of the I mean, I, I haven't uh, I, I must admit I'm not uh, my knowledge on the, the whole like the the, the whole uh, theory of place of scene rewilding is quite limited. So, yeah, thank you for thank you for clarifying for clarifying that it's it, it def, it's definitely fascinating to think that this could even be possible in principle, at least, mm -hmm. uh, of course. Not by like we don't even need to like clone the woolly mammoth as they are they are actually trying to do that I think in, mm -hmm. in Russia but even 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 without do even without having to resort to that because yeah at least not not with mammals but with other prehistoric animals like we have multiple we have at least five movies who say that it's quite a bad idea <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, like, but yeah even even with extant animals and like. And by the way, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we ever if we ever manage to clone a Velociraptor, people would complain because it had because it would have feathers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So um, and again, you you were you were talking at some point about the um, release of um, at least surrogate megafauna in Florida, and that was at least first of all i think that was the first time i ever heard someone talking about animal releases in florida in a positive light yes in quite a while <laughs> and that's and and here we go to the to my next question because at least florida is known for the insane amount of invasive species or at least non-native species that have been uh, released in there like most famously perhaps burmese pythons but also like tegus and chameleons and iguanas and you name it. So, and you you have recently started a podcast, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, mm -hmm. which yeah, it's it's spelled like it's it's a pun. I will write it in the comments so that at least it's <laughs> so that at least it uh, <laughs> it's it's clear because I, I really like that title, where you, oh, uh, you focus on the the problem of invasive on the invasive species mostly. And indeed, like, what what's the what is an invasive species like? First of all, and what why are they so uh, dangerous for um, for the stability of an ecosystem? Yeah, so invasive species are probably like my absolute specialty. I have actually spent time in Florida uh, removing removing Burmese pythons and tegus, um, but obviously here on a daily basis, I work with hundreds of species of invasive and non-native plants. And invasive species are essentially, they are specifically categorized in a formal sense as a non-native species that takes hold in an ecosystem outside of its native range and establishes and takes over um, due to a lack of hindering factors like natural predators or any environmental hindrance like that. However, if you listen to the Anthropocene podcast, I have a slightly different opinion because I consider an invasive species to also include native species that are exceptionally aggressive due to some t type of anthropocentric influence. So, for example, I have to manage species that are native to Illinois in my ecosystems because without the typical native flora that would normally prevent them from overgrowing an area and condense their numbers, they get out of control and they will suffocate out more beneficial, less common uh, native species. So I consider them to be invasive, even though they are native. So if you're asking me, an invasive species is a species that is preventing the natural biodiversity of an area from occurring. 
and it can either be native or non-native with the caveat of if it is native it is aggressive because of some sort of anthropocentric influence so some sort of human lying underlying factor being that it might just be a disturbance to that area that allows you know goldenrod for example to come back and mass and just take over an area Oh no! Yeah, I think I think that your your view definitely addresses one point that uh, that I was always that I've, uh, I've always been curious about because I th at least in my experience I've seen that um, the our common perception of native versus non-native species goes on a country basis, but I mean wildlife doesn't really care about political borders. So yeah. like even you you can have even if a species if a certain species is native to like I don't know uh, California. And you 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 bring it to Florida for some reason, yeah, it was native to the United States, but I would hardly consider it native if you brought it on the opposite on the opposite coast. And I mean, th this is a quite extreme example, but mm -hmm. even even in the even at least at much uh, shorter uh, shorter scales of distance, I think this is this is something that that I've always found missing in uh, at least in, in what little I know about the in the, the whole discourse on native versus uh, non-native um, wildlife species. Yes, we also have a slightly newer term too to categorize certain species that are considered neo-native or neo-invasive, essentially saying that because of climate change and anthropocentric factors, you know, just native species are extending outside of their natural range. So I'm thinking specifically like plants, or I guess I could use a, a fauna ex example, coyotes, for example. We didn't necessarily introduce them to all the new places, but they're spreading across the United States and becoming naturalized in these areas because of a, a available habitat or changing climatic factors that allows them for to establish in areas where they previously could not establish. So... Uh, when we look at milkweed, for an example, common milkweed is extending significantly further out of its range um, because of warmer climates. It's, it's able to grow more north than it typically would, and also it's able to grow more south as well. It's just kind of expanding, um, of course, coupled with the introduction to other states where it's non-native um, just due to, you know, seeds and, and human, human interactions with it. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, and again, it's and it's still like, of course, I, I, I promised myself that I wouldn't bring this up, but sorry, I can't help it because, like, yeah, you you mentioned coyotes, and it's still. Uh, I I remember um, a friend of mine who, yeah, she uh, she also lives in she she lives in um, she also lives in the in the lives in the central United States, uh, and yeah, she would at some point on Facebook. I remember a Facebook post of hers where she basically um, pointed out how like hypocritical and uh, naive in a sense it is to like consider coyotes invasive where they are spreading uh, with out of sort of natural drivers while not considering cats invasive <laughs> when <laughs> we literally introduce them all over the world so yeah mm -hmm. I promised myself I wouldn't talk about cats <laughs> because that that's that, that that could lead that 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 is material for for like wars basically but um uh, yeah it's I, I just i i just i just couldn't i just couldn't keep could, couldn't keep my word so apologies for that but yeah yeah that's uh, no that's totally fine um yeah i i i it's very difficult to classify certain species as invasive non-native and it's one of those things where as we know it's in science nothing is ever clearly cut and dry which makes our job as science communicators even harder and scientists in general i'm not even going to get into species but um <laughs> like you can't just have a term that encompasses everything especially as an environmental scientist in in any capacity we know that nature does not conform to one strict path ever you you know you could have you could have a study species you've been studying for years and years and years and you're like oh it'll never do this and then it does it and you're like oh okay <laughs> well all right i guess we have to throw that knowledge out because it did this one time for some reason so yeah it's invasive is a is a broader term than i think a lot of people realize and i think it's misused incorrectly relatively frequently Oh yes, uh, definitely. And indeed, um, 
uh, David here, one of uh, one of uh, <clears throat> of our listeners in the audience, is commenting that yeah, cats are arguably invading the UK, a significant threat to uh, to their wildcat species. And indeed, yeah, even even in in Europe, like the European wildcat is is definitely endangered. And of course, it's not only because of uh, house cats, definitely not, but still, like even hybridization with feral house cats is a serious is a serious concern for for the survival of that species. So yeah, there we go again. Okay, cats over. I promise this time, <laughs> this time I will <laughs> I swear to God I will not I won't mention them again. <laughs> no uh, promises that I won't. I might bring them up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, in, the, in that case I I'm not going to stop you if you do. So yeah, feel free. <laughs> but yeah, so um I need to go back to uh the to the beginning of the of the interview you said that uh you wish you could focus on herbs uh the whole time and well yeah i definitely i definitely relate to that uh <laughs> but so yeah just to uh just say that yeah you are um you have you have been uh working with herbs specifically for uh at least in at least uh recently for um for a long uh, on a on a regular basis and so in terms of within the context of what you uh, what you do in terms of um of uh eco ecological studies and restoration like uh how do how does your work with herbs specifically fit into that so um do you do you use them as indicator species or are they um are they just uh, is it just in the sense of uh public perception um it's it's definitely more in line with with indicator species, a, a, a slight anecdote here, but originally my, my focus of my study was snakes. Um, and I put out 200 snake boards throughout the natural areas uh, that I manage. And in a year I got exactly zero snakes under any of those boards uh, and <laughs> zero encounters or anything, which is why I study turtles now. <laughs> um, because they're in significantly more abundance in these fragmented habitats. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm looking at turtle spatial ecology, specifically pond turtles. So for those of you who might be listening and are curious, Illinois is like in the middle of the U.S., middle of the Midwest, uh, right next to the Great Lakes region. So we have a lot of wetlands, but we have no like major waterways other than, of course, the Mississippi watershed. But outside of that, it's mostly creeks and things like that that lead to these retention and detention ponds that are uh, established as wetland mitigation, which is essentially when they develop an area, they have to put in some sort of water housing area, and I convert those into natural wetlands and habitats by restoring their flora. So I have a bunch of what you could consider micro habitats that are, which are areas less than 100 uh, square acres. And... These microhabitats have these ponds and these native areas in them, and they're under management. And I am looking at turtle occurrence in these areas with how often they are managed with herbicide, the amount of herbicide they're using, ones that are unmanaged versus managed. So I have control ones to see if there's a difference between them the, to varying degrees of management. And I'm essentially looking at how, because all of these waterways are connected via some a creek or stream or, or what have you. They can all interact with one another. So I'm working both within my land management area and forest preserve area throughout northern to middle Illinois, looking at the movement of these turtles to see... Are they favoring areas that have higher floristic biodiversity? Are they favoring areas that have X, Y, and Z? What are the impacts of restoration on these possibly sensitive Trelonian species? And looking at their spatial ecology as an indicator for, or not necessarily, looking at the biodiversity of the ecosystem as an indicator for their sp spatial ecology seeing like, okay, this area doesn't get sprayed for aquatic plants every year. It has a higher biodiversity of turtles. This is an example. This is not a specific uh, like reference to what I've come, what the data shows in my research right now. But just as an example, is an area going to be more or less beneficial because of, uh, you know, floristic biodiversity or is there no relation um, but yeah, that's that's essentially the connection is I'm just I'm still considering myself an ecologist as many people still, uh, for whatever reason, could call me a herpetologist because technically I study turtles. 
<laughs> but I'm really looking at their their ecology and how it interacts with the the floristic biodiversity. So the the main part of my job is managing these ecosystems, but also taking extensive floristic data on these ecosystems and you know soil and hydrology, everything to understand the quality of these ecosystems and how it's affecting these turtle movements. Yeah, and so yeah, well, once again, yeah, we 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 go back to uh, we go back to what we were saying. Uh, I think it. I think it was. Uh, it was my first question that everything is so interconnected that even if you like, it's it's easy to say that yeah, you focus on turtles, but yeah, that also means uh, yeah, considering a swathe of other of other variables like um, floristic factors, soil, water quality, um, and whatever, whatever, yeah, like you name it. So like. One thing, one thing that I wanted to ask you is like, as when you when you are when you are at work, like how do you when you are when you design a research project, even like how do you keep track of all this of all these the, these things that you need to know and you need to constantly be aware of, and how do you how do you trace the link between the the links between them? So I guess I could I could answer this by essentially talking about how my hypothesis formed for the basis of this research. Uh, I have worked in a bunch of different rest ecological restoration firms before I got this position as head ecologist. And in those areas, we had worked in many, many sensitive habitats for endangered herp herpetofauna. And I noticed that during the restoration process, while we were trying to restore the floristic biodiversity, the sensitive herpetofauna, the populations at least appeared to be declining as far as we would run into these sensitive herpetofauna significantly less as the restoration went on. And now restoration, um, I probably should explain this at the beginning, but essentially restoration will come down to mechanical, biological, cultural, and different practices. Mechanical being like cutting or mowing, biological being like introducing a natural predator to an invasive species cultural being burning and chemical of course being using chemicals to manage these areas uh, a lot of times it's done in an aggressive basically completely thorough manner that encompasses the entirety of a project specifically to restore the floristic levels as quickly and effectively as possible but what often happens is there is not a lot of consideration for the fauna and Although that habitat floristically might not be ideal, it's still clearly supporting these sensitive herpetofauna. So by removing it entirely through all of these different processes, you're basically interrupting that, although it's not necessarily natural, it's still a niche habitat for these, these sensitive species. So I noticed that you know, at least it appeared to be a decline in species during management. So I wanted to see if restoration was having negative effects on these herpetofauna. And it kind of sort of just evolved into this looking at everything. And being that my background is, is botanical and knowing plants. And then when you know plants, you have to know soil and water because if something's not growing somewhere, that's generally the reason why. And so my job is still managing these areas floristically so i still look at the soil the water and the floristic level but now i'm just adding the biological levels as well so i have the benefit of because i manage these areas and they are like i know them like the back of my hand i can tell you where pretty much every single plant species is in the exact location where it is every year just because i know them so well it helps me design this framework for this this research that i've set up now that being said there's like four or five iterations of my research that have had to be amended because of different factors that i've learned as it progresses and i've had to change my research throw out data that doesn't operate within the new confines of the data and most of it comes down to the fact that people suck and just don't let science happen without interacting with it <laughs> Well, that 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 I I could I could literally tattoo that on my forehead. Like <laughs> the reason why this happens is because people suck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
that 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 could basically one of, one of the most universal responses you you could possibly <laughs> think of. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so since you you were saying that now you 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 know uh, you know your uh, your study area so well that you could that you could literally like point to where every single species is. I was. I think that that is that is a good introduction for the the next the next thing that I wanted to discuss with you, which is the concept of shifting baselines, uh, which is also um, rec a recurrent uh, recurrent topic in uh, when when it comes especially to to restoration. Because like I remember reading when I read uh, Silent Spring by uh, Rachel Carson, where she basically talked about the devastating impact of uh, heavy pesticides on um, Ameri uh, American ecosystems in the fifth and between the forties and the sixties, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was wondering. So since restoration is about, yeah, it, as the name suggests, restoring uh, habitat quality to uh, a previous standard. But like, yeah, what what does previous mean? Like, what, what, how do we know? Like, what the what should what what should what we should aim for when it comes to uh, to restoring habitat? Because even like what what people were used to in the 1960s might have been already degraded compared to what was uh, what was there like in the early 1900s and and so on. So what, how do we how do we deal with that? Yeah, so uh, that is uh, a controversial question because a lot of restoration ecologists would would I think that. I think that I have noticed that there's a trend where we focus specifically on floristic biodiversity because we can see that and we can manage that specifically. It doesn't change. I mean, like, obviously different flowers grow, there's different growing seasons, what have you, but the flowers are always there. The plants are always there. We can see how that ecosystem is being restored, whereas fauna move in and out of an ecosystem, so it's more difficult to gauge the impacts on them. And I think that right now they're starting and we're, I would say we're right just at the beginning of understanding that we can't just be going out and restoring things en masse on a floristic level only without taking into account the, the, the fauna of that ecosystem that's being restored. And I think that that's an issue because, in, I mean, that it's the basis of what I'm trying to look at right now is restoration on a floristic level impacting these you know, the, the flora and fauna that exists there. Um, and essentially what we need to do is change that dynamic and look at, because it, it's ecology, it's not botany. I mean, botany is a part of ecology, but if we're really doing ecological restoration, then we have to look at it at an ecological level. And to that effect, if you're only looking at a restored ecosystem as one that has a dominant native plant community, you can't call that ecosystem restored if the fauna aspect of it is not present or, you know, to the same degree as the floristic levels. And when we say restoration, it does imply that there is an end to it. But it is ongoing. Even if I have an area that, let's say, has 99% uh, native plants, which is a standard that we ne typically need to meet if we're doing... I don't work for a contractor anymore, but when I worked for a contractor previously, we had to get a 99% native plant community in the, the areas, which sounds ridiculous, but it's actually... It, it, if it's done properly, it's not that difficult to do because there's so many plants. And the way that they do the methodology, it's not necessarily like you can't just have like one plan out of a hundred. It's it's different, but regardless, um, the ninety nine percent plants are not the same as you know having an ecosystem that functioned with those native pollinators. For example, I can put lupine in an area. But the Carner's blue butterfly, which is an endangered uh, species of butterfly that only pollinates and is uses that plant as a host, isn't going to just show up in that ecosystem. So lupine is a rare plant in itself, but that ecosystem is lacking its typical pollinator that would normally be there historically anyway. So you can't call it restored. Even if an area is 99% restored, you can't necessarily bring it back 
and just leave it untouched because what's going to happen is you're going to get impacts from these secondary successors, which are almost always going to be these invasive non-native plants that exist in these areas. So restoration is a, is a continuous thing that doesn't necessarily just operate as a, all right, we've done it, we can go because somebody has to take, take, you know, even if you're using a contractor, yeah, they might meet that 99% standard, but essentially once that's done, somebody else has to continuously manage that to keep out these invasive species that are just going to move their way in. So until you can, you know, find a way to remove invasives permanently, then restoration is always going to be an ongoing process, which to a lot of people is, is somewhat discouraging for some reason, but it's like, it was a lot of hard work to screw up these ecosystems. It's going to be a lot of hard work to restore them. Yeah, that 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 definitely makes sense. And yeah, indeed, it, it puts it puts things in 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 perspective for sure. Because like thinking of of what of like the the action of like centuries of deliberate, uh, more often than not, uh, destruction of. Uh, of natural ecosystems now now we, we we definitely can't expect to expect them to bounce back like in the blink of an eye and then stay there stay like that forever uh so yeah that's the thank you for thank you for um emphasizing that and yeah before i uh, before i go on with the with the with the last question i would like to remind to the audience that you can also uh, ask questions for uh ask questions to uh, to nicholas in the in the comments so if you have Every, if you have anything that you uh, that you want to uh, to ask him, any curiosity or such, please feel free. Uh, just just shoot it, type it, and whatever we we will try to uh, we will try to answer it. And uh, so yeah, for the for the last of my questions, uh, Nicholas, I'd actually uh, now, now I, I will go with the we'll go we will start with an anecdote, uh, which is basically how we met, like sort of, because of course you know. Uh, 10,000 kilometers distance and whatever. Mm -hmm. So basically it was when I, um, I offered to, uh, when you, on Instagram, you basically asked um, to send yeah, so videos, um, to ask fellow, other fellow scientists to send videos, like short videos uh, highlighting, briefly describing their research focus so that you could show them to, uh, to kids that you were, um, uh, that you were uh, you were teaching, mm -hmm. and yeah, I did uh, I did that, and yeah, and then you sent me uh, those incredible like drawings that the kids made <laughs> after after they saw my video, like the, all those things of like um, rattlesnakes with mouth agape and venom dripping from their fangs mm -hmm. and all that. I, I I that that warmed my heart like few things have done this <laughs> year so far. So just really thank you for that and. So yeah, I was um, my question is so you you you're also active in on the education and science communication front, um, both in in real life and on social media. So, um, what what what's your experience on on that front? Because like you you mentioned that the the community there usually is hostile to um, environmental environmentalist discourse and such. So. How did you? How did you get? Did you make? Did you get into that? Did you? Did, how did you breach this? This like preconceived uh, opinions and uh, and such. Right. So I think there's a kind of a twofold. First off, I, I noticed that there's a lot of not necessarily disrespect, but a lack of respect for scientists because a lot of people see scientists as being elitist or holier than thou, or essentially just thinking, "Hey, I'm you know." I'm a scientist, I'm better than you, which is, in my experience, more often than not, not the case. However, it goes without saying that, of course, there are examples within which people will, you know, talk, if you're a scientist, and you know a lot about a subject, you'll talk down to somebody because they don't necessarily have that same level of information as you. And we're all capable of learning the same things. We just haven't necessarily dedicated the time to learning the same things. So it's important as science communicators to remember that the 99.99 percent of people are not scientists and that's where our support is going to come from so we need to reach out to that 99.99 percent to get them to support us and what we're doing so that we can work together to actually make genuine differences in the world in as far as environmental science strides go um and 
the science communication is vital to that because if you can't communicate what science you're doing to anybody but scientists, then it's effectively not necessarily good science because you have to get the support from the general public because that's where your funding is going to come from. That's where, you know, just support for your work is going to come from. And that's how you change the societal, you know, thought process that scientists are super stuck up and we're unapproachable and we're all, you know, these like lab coat wearing, I mean, I do not look like a scientist right now or the typical, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> image I mean, of a scientist that they you, picture in you, movies. You do because like, yeah, because I, I, I know how it, how it really is like 99% of the time, but yeah, definitely not the, not the like mainstream uh, image of like a, an old, old man with like white hair and a lab coat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe sometimes but definitely not all the time um so yeah so it's 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 difficult i think it's difficult too for a lot of scientists to look through a lens other than a scientific lens and i just like to think like i will over explain things to everybody if you can talk to a room of people that have both phd students and five-year-old kids on the same subject and keep them both intrigued in what you're saying, then you are doing a fantastic job at science communication. It's not something that comes easy and it's not something that everybody needs to do, but it is something that needs to be done to properly, you know, make a societal change to support science overall. And I think that's, that's vitally important. Um, I have the luxury of, yes, I teach classes, I do events and things like that, but people have to sign up for that. So that means they want to see me. So I don't have to like teach people every single day. And, and like a teacher, I absolutely, for professors and teachers who have to teach people required classes and things like that, I have so much respect and sympathy for them because I have, sure. I have on rare occasion had to teach people who were not interested in what I was talking about at all. And no matter how passionate you are, if somebody genuinely does not care about what you're saying, it's very difficult to get them to shift their, their mentality. Uh, that being said, there's no bitterness towards them. You just need to change your, your communication in a way that they can slowly come over to your level. But I would say that I'm, I'm lucky insofar as like when I do interact with the public, more often than not, the, the interactions are very good and positive and they don't necessarily have have the negative connotation even if i'm in an area that is just absolutely surrounded by corn and rednecks <laughs> yeah no i, I i'm uh, i'm sure this is i'm sure this is definitely the case for for our audience as well as well today and yeah now um let, let going back to the to the kids specifically like of course when you when you're dealing with children like everything has to be different because like you you can talk to them in terms of like uh, um lot cavoltera equation uh, eyes of clients or uh, something something like that so it, it all has to be to to go on to to be explained on a at, at a, at a, on a, kid, on a at a kid's level but then again in back to like to those those children who uh who sent who re replied to 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 my video like some some of them were asking questions that Especially one, I don't remember who 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 that one was, but it was like, I remember he was ask he or she was uh, was asking like, what happened? What, what would happen if we like took venoms from two different snake species and combined them together and, <laughs> and gave it to someone? Like, what what would happen there? And I was like, damn, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, kids ask the best questions. I, my favorite question I've ever asked is. Well, what if, because I told the kids that king snakes eat other snakes, and they said, well, what if, because I was like, they can eat, what if, what if a bigger snake came along? I was like, well, king snakes can technically eat snakes that are bigger than them. They're like, but what if a king snake came up to another king snake that's the exact same size as it? Who would win? <laughs> and I'm like, great question. But you bring yeah. up a, a fantastic point, and and I think most educators realize this, is that at least in the United States, because I can't speak for other educational systems, but in our, our failed educational system in the United States, we have these like very strict tiers of what everybody needs to learn. 
But if somebody's passionate about something, they're going to know so much more about a certain topic than, than the other people. So when I'm talking to a class, it might be this person's first time ever seeing a snake in their entire life. And they don't even know like anything about snakes. They think they're slimy. They think they're poisonous. All this ridiculous stuff. And um, then the other person might be like, Oh yeah, so I noticed that there's like a difference in like the mouth scales around these two species of skinks and that's the only way you can identify them. I saw the YouTube video once and I'm like, dude, you're nine. Like <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I learned that last year. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so it you it's it's a you realize that education is not like a linear thing people learn what they desire to learn about like obviously there's things that everybody needs to know to function in society but education doesn't have to be linear so when i design a class like i can design a class and i can reuse that exact same class for pretty much every level from elementary school through college to adult because i just vary the amount of information i include and I communicate it in a way that is essentially interesting. I will say I do have a cheat in so far as I almost always bring live animals to where it's applicable, which well, pretty that, much I mean, that's, that, yeah, that's a lot. Like, yeah, that's yeah, it's a great way to get people's attention. That, that really, yeah, that, that's definitely an attention grabber. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I've been there too for sure. Like, I lived in the in the Netherlands for uh, for like nearly nearly five years and. Much as much as I can sort of understand it, I never learned to speak Dutch. Mm -hmm. But still, like yeah, when I, when I did outreach events and such, I did and w with an animal in my hands, I didn't even need to because like, <laughs> come on, that's right, <laughs> right. Everyone was like was like was like coming over, and uh, even if like li little kids, like everyone speaks English there, but of course, like little kids, like five years old or six years old, not that much, right? But still, like the. It, we, we we still managed to like understand each other sort in a sort of way through the and through the the animal. So yeah, that's that's definitely a great point as well. Oh yeah, it's uh, I I love using animals, or at least at the very least, bring a physical example of something just to break up the traditional. Here's a picture of something. This is what it looks like in this picture. I try my best to bring a physical example of something, even if it's not a live specimen, just because people can see it visually with their eyes, and it's always different than what they they anticipate it looking like in their head. So I think that learning can go in so many different ways and I, I really really do love when teachers and professors try to break that mold and you know communicate their learning in a way that sort of <laughs> really gets the, the students engaged and that's that's the biggest thing is getting people engaged it's kind of easy with kids um, as they get older it becomes a little bit more difficult because they're ingrained that you know school is boring and it's not fun or whatever but it doesn't necessarily have to be and I think that a good science communicator can change the mind of just about anyone to to see, you know, whatever message they're trying to convey. Oh yeah, definitely. Even even though sometimes sometimes it's definitely it's definitely hard to uh, hard to remind ourselves of that. But still, yeah, a very very good point. And so yeah, since I see there are uh, no questions in the in the comments, well, you're missing out, guys. Let me tell you. Uh, um, I <laughs> I'd say that yeah, this uh, they say that we have reached the conclusion of um, of our talk for today. So once again, thank you so much, Nicholas. It was an absolutely great great interview. Um, I I, le I learned a lot uh, definitely. And again, yeah. People now will be like, "Yeah, you say it every time when you when you when you finish interviews." Yes, I do because it's true, and there's there's a reason why I decided to do this in the first place, uh, and I hope this has. I'm, I hope, but I, I'm actually uh, I'm definitely sure this uh, this this was the case for for our audience as well. So thank you again, and for everyone here in the audience. Um, you don't want to miss next week's episode. We we're going to be back with a new episode of the Snake Man Slayer next Wednesday with uh, photographer, conservation journalist, and activist Selina Chien. So yeah, I hope to see you all there, and thank you for being here for being here today today as well. So goodbye everyone, and have a great weekend.